Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise in support of the budget. Uh, I would like to talk about shifting our youth mindset towards ASEAN. But before that, I would like to make three brief points about the budget. One, we must be wary about dipping more into our reserve income. We can argue about the precise percentage of NRIC to use, but the important thing is we must continue to grow our reserves. If our reserves do not grow, it may not continue to anchor the stability of our growing economy. As a small city-state, Singapore has been described as a small boat in a large ocean. During the last big storm, the 2008 financial crisis, our reserves served as an anchor, thereby providing us with much-needed stability. Recently, some has commented that our reserve has already gotten too much and we can afford to spend a little bit more of our reserve income. However, I feel that uh, many commentators did not uh, talk about the fact that Singapore's economy is still growing and we're actually a small ship that's continuing to grow in size. With geographical uncertainty and the rolling back of financial regulations in the US, the only certainty is that bigger and larger financial storms will eventually come to our shores. So if our reserve fail to keep up with our growing economy, maybe not at the next crisis, but a few crises down the road, our reserves may not be of a sufficient size to anchor the bigger Singapore economy then. And if Singapore flounders, who will save us? IMF or World Bank? Even if they do, at what cost, especially for the average Singaporean? Therefore, we must be wary of the serious implication of not growing our reserves. My second point is that our government must actively help our seniors to monetize their assets to pay for retirement. Because retirement, retirees have no income, they are more impacted by the GST compared to the other Singaporean. Some retirees, even those living in the asset, uh, private estates, are asset rich and cash poor. To help them manage the cost of living, I hope our government can help put some urgency to helping them monetize the assets. I've spoken about this issue in depth during the recent February parliamentary motion on senior policy. Therefore, I hope the government can continue to actively ensure that such options exist in Singapore, either through reverse mortgage of larger flats and private estates, or through specialized reverse mortgage funds like those done in France. Third, I hope we can all recognize that ITMs are a long-term economic transformation plan and not push for immediate results, especially for in terms of economic output numbers. Recently, some commentators have spoke about the effectiveness of the ITM. But I would like to point out that any major economic transformation needs at least three to five years before it's fully illustrated and flows into the economic numbers, especially economic output numbers. Let me illustrate. For example, the government can launch a new program to encourage businesses to use artificial intelligence in, let's say, year one. Major businesses with their budgetary process will need up to a year to make major shifts to take advantage of that program. The efforts of the business will also take time to impact the bottom line. After the bottom line is made, it would still take many more months, even one to two years, before the improvements are reflected in any company's uh, audited accounts. And then more time is needed before the numbers are finally submitted to ACRA and to our Department of Statistics. That is why we need three to five years before we can fully comment on the effectiveness of programs in terms of economic output numbers, whether it's GDP or value-added per worker or productivity numbers. In the meantime, I feel that our debate should focus on input indicators of in economic transformation, by which I mean the quality and the accessibility of transformation programs for our businesses and workers, and let's not get fixed on immediate economic output numbers. Let me now touch on my main point of the speech today, which is getting Singaporeans to think ASEAN. I agree with Minister Heng that Singapore should be a global Asian node of technology, innovation and enterprise. By and large, I think we're making good progress. However, I think we can do more to tap on 
the rise of rising ASEAN. I'm glad that our economic policy is keeping up rising ASEAN. Before, uh, beyond the, Asia, uh, the, the ASEAN economic community, we're also setting up the infrastructure office, which is contributing to more infrastructure development within ASEAN. We're expanding our Global Innovation Alliance into ASEAN's innovation network, and we are pushing for the creation of an ASEAN e-commerce platform. Beyond the announced measures, I would like to further suggest that as ASEAN chair this year, Singapore encouraged other major ASEAN economies to increase funding for the ASEAN Secretariat. A stronger Secretariat will improve ASEAN's ability to track and execute various commitments as, so as to unlock the full potential of the agreed measures. For example, a stronger secretary would be able to help us better coordinate action in response to non-tariff protection uh, measures within the AEC. I'm also heartened to see the strengthening of talent development programs. This includes PCP for Southeast Asia Ready Talent, Skills Future ASEAN Leadership Program, Go ASEAN Award, Young Talent Program, and Infrastructure Development Internships. I hope that if these programs prove successful, the government can quickly scale them up. The creation of Enterprise Singapore, as well as the role of more programs to support companies internationalized, will strengthen our efforts. However, I feel that much more work is needed for Singaporeans to think ASEAN. Today, there's a dichotomy between the tremendous opportunities offered by ASEAN and the perception of ASEAN by everybody, everyday Singaporeans. Many Singaporeans I speak to associate our neighboring countries with affordable, trade, affordable uh, holiday destinations or places where they go abroad to do community service. In fact, many Singaporeans assume that many parts of ASEAN are backward region and will stay so for a long time. But many parts of ASEAN are growing quickly and these assumptions are no longer true. As such, it is very important for us to change the mindset, especially among our youth. After all, while our government and our companies are more involved in ASEAN, the full benefits can truly be realized if our Singaporeans are personally involved in the opportunities. So I would like to propose uh, five uh, ways we can encourage our people, especially our youth and PMATs, to see the possibilities in ASEAN. One, we could shift the balance of tertiary education internships, study trips, and exchange programs towards developing countries, especially ASEAN. And when they go abroad, we should ensure that our youth see the bright spots and the center of innovation within ASEAN. Two, we can promote uh, exchanges between student leaders. As a young Singaporean studying in the US many years ago, I was deeply involved in the largest student leader exchange between US and China. That allowed me to understand that lifelong friendships can be forged over time if the program is executed well. There is scope to do such a program, linking the future leaders of Singapore with that of our neighboring ASEAN countries. Three, we should encourage more interactions between our students and the officials from ASEAN countries who are currently studying in Singapore. Today, many ASEAN officials uh, spend short training stints in Singapore and they are here because they are slated for greater things back in their home country. So therefore, there's scope for us to network our students with them so that we can benefit from their in-depth insights, insights that are not frequently uh, covered publicly. Four, we should encourage the teaching of ASEAN-specific knowledge. By that, I mean getting our tertiary institutes to teach ASEAN languages, business cultures, and political culture through both formal courses and guest speaker series. Singapore has a deep expertise in the region through many excellent institutions such as the LKY Public School, uh, School of Public Policy, RSIS, ACI, and ISEAS. We also have multilateral institutes such as World Bank who have a deep presence in Singapore. Our leading bankers, lawyers, management consultants have tremendous experience working in ASEAN. Therefore, we can tap on these institutions and our experts to open up courses and talk to our students and young entrepreneurs. My last recommendation is to create an annual Business ASEAN Conference, much like the successful Business China Conference series, which put an annual spotlight 
on the exciting developments in ASEAN. The goal of all this is to get our people to think ASEAN. If we can use our year as ASEAN chair to start this mindset shift, the opportunities for Singapore and Singaporeans will naturally follow. With that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the budget. Thank you. Ms. Sylvia Lim. Uh, not present. All right, uh, Mr. Chong Hee-yong. <laughs> 